thank you everyone for sticking here. Uh, Sunday afternoon, late, we all want to get back home and enjoy the, the, what's left of the weekend. Um, so uh, I thank you for staying here. And um, I'm going to talk about reproducible multilanguage data science with Conda. And the structure of this talk is going to be the following. First, I'm going to introduce this, the concept of um, the data science and what involves in doing data science. Uh, what do we, why do we care about multilanguage? Um, what, what are the requirements when we talk about reproducibility? Um, then we're going to see uh, what Conda is, and then specifically how Conda fits uh, with all these uh, other three words that we've, well, that we've introduced. And finally, I'm going to give a practical example of a, a library I've worked on that's called Topic. Here are the, the link um, of my slides. Uh, you can follow along. Um, so let's start with the first term, data science. Um, and, and we're going to focus on what are the tas tasks involved in this field. And if we look at uh, data science, we can actually classify uh, the different tasks in four, in four areas. Um, the first one is the one I would call like this ad hoc analysis. Um, uh, Kind of like, and your output in this ad hoc analysis is kind of some kind of report, some type of data cleaning, um, summarization of what's in your data, uh, some metrics, some munging and cleaning, and some kind of data output. Then we have this task that I call the main problem. It's when you have to apply um, your data science to solve a specific problem. It can be a prediction pro problem, a classification. Uh, you kind of want to explore what's in your data. And, the up, and we're going to call that output a project or a model. Then we have the task that I call like algorithm development. And that's where you actually output um, a library or a package, and you're providing functionality for these domain problems, right? And that's like uh, scikit-learn uh, in Python, a library like Weka in Java, or Caret in R. Then in data science, we all, we're also involved in... Um, production, right, in making these models available in production environments. And your output in that case is actually the pipeline, the architecture, architecture implementing um, that, those libraries, those algorithms, those domain problems in your application. And we can see things like recommendation systems or, or fraud detection. And I said this is general data science, right? But these tasks are not always done by the data scientist. We also find other, other contributors, other team players, that also are involved in these data science tasks. And I, I've named them this way. Uh, there, there might be uh, other ways of naming, naming them. The first one is um, data analyst. Um, we can also call this, this, that might be in this, mainly this uh, ad hoc analysis, but sometimes may go into more of the modeling problem too, depending on their skills. Then we have the title, the data scientist title. And that's uh, mainly in this domain problem of solving specifically um, um, problems in a specific domain and giving a solution. But sometimes these data scientists also might be involved in the algorithm development of those packages. Then uh, in algorithm development, you can find traditional software developers. But also, um, as, as we heard in some of these t um, talks previously, um, you also might need someone that's more familiar with the math background, right, in, in making sure that it's able to uh, implement those algorithms. And I call that computational scientist. And then in the area of production and development, you, uh, um, you, you're going to have involved people that actually understand the architecture, that, that are going to actually um, develop and make sure that the, the operation is running. And we call that DevOps or architect. So just three um, things to uh, keep in mind in, this, in the data science section. That involves different tasks, may have different deliverables, and there are different contributors in, in, in this area. Let's explore now multilanguage. And this is a survey from um, O'Reilly. Uh, I don't know if you can see it very well, uh, but it's a survey that they did uh, uh, on data science salary survey, and they ask people um, that work in the field of data science, what are the most commonly used tools in their daily life? And then you can see 
um, the background is mainly people, not only developers, but also people in like the data science business. And then you see a lot of Windows SQL, Excel, R, Linux, Python, um, Mac OS, Java, JavaScript. Right? So we see a lot of languages and a lot of different tools being used. What if we kind of put those languages on top of this task that we've previously seen? Where do they fit? Where they're actually, uh, what are the major languages used in the different types of tasks? And we see these first three, which are um, the three languages, for example, that Jupyter has in its name, Julia, Python, and R. And um, those lines are very hard to draw. Like every time I've shown these slides to someone else, someone said, oh, you need to put like the slide one millimeter more to the left, to the right. That's like that language is completely wrong. Um, this can do everything, right? So this is, I have a disclaimer on the bottom saying this is just my personal opinion. It's not based in any quantifiable way. Um, and mainly I've taken into account like the maturity of the language, how long it's been around, like make it longer. Or, and mainly like what's the most common, common or strongest um, area. So I, I've, as I've said, the, um, these three languages, Python, R, Julia, are more, we can see that they're focused on like this uh, contributor that we've called the data scientist, right? That's something that, that users are using. And then we can see Python has gone more into the way, uh, reach into the production line because we have a more variety of uh, um, different types of contributors using that language too. Um, then we see, we've seen that in the big data space, um, the, the actual languages that have evolved in the Hadoop world um, has been Java, right? And, and, and those Java architectures. So that's what I've put the, in, in the context of data science, this Java language more into the production. Uh, but you see that the data scientist itself, this role of domain specific problems, is more, um, uses less this language compared to maybe Python or R. Then we see those, all these uh, new Spark um, um, hype, right, with Scala. And, and we see that they're mainly focused on this algorithm development, these packages, Spark, MLIP. Um, and it's trying to get into the production. It's not uh, yet there yet still, but, it, but it's, it's getting right. It's the new hype people are starting to um, deploy uh, try to deploy this, this um, things. It, they ha they're having their, their, some of the troubles, but uh, they're, they're trying to get there. And we see another language, uh, more of the Lispy people that are more in like computational scientists, uh, they like these Lispy languages, right? And they're, they're developing, they're trying to push uh, also these Lispy languages into the data science field um, and also into production with projects like Storm. How about we have like one left, this uh, data analyst that we've called. Um, they're mainly uh, still focused on Excel, right? And we have maybe some adventurous da data analysts that are more curious and say, oh, what's there to it? And maybe those people go into more SaaS, like um, commercial software, um, or the equivalent R. And, and they're trying to get those skills to not just do this ad hoc analysis, but also push into more the domain projects, the modeling part. Multilanguage, what, what, what has happened uh, in data science regarding multilanguage? Well, we see these language agnostic applications, like we've seen Jupyter um, or Con that I'm not going to talk about. And we see that all these tools are also providing multilanguage interfaces. It's important to provide interfaces so that your user that we've seen can use a variety of languages, chooses the language of their choice. So, for example, Bokeh provides uh, a variety of interfaces like R bokeh, uh, Scala bokeh, um, Julia, um, Lua, Python, Spark, we, can, we also see that provides PySpark interfaces, um, uh, etc. So the um, ideas from this section is data science is multilanguage, um, there's language agnostics applications being built, and uh, it's important to have bindings and APIs too, uh, so that your user can choose what's, what's lang what language they want to use. Let's talk now about reproducibility. So let's, let's try to think a little bit what are the requirements for us to reproduce a data science task. And I've come up with like these four simple things. 
First, it might seem obvious, but you need to share your code, right? Uh, this might seem uh, uh, obvious, but the scientific community actually has not that has is trying to do that, right? Like you share your paper, you're not always share your code. So um, in order to reproduce the first step, share your code, right? Um, and and share it not only the, uh, not only the code itself, but other things like how what random seeds you use, how you initialize variables, etc. Then we have to control versions, right? If uh, the project was done today, would it like run two years from now when maybe the project's finished, your your paper's done, uh, someone wants to use it? And and that's not not only dependencies, but the language itself. If I create a project right now with uh, Python 2.7 and I get it and then I leave it, um, you know, on my computer, and two years from now someone wants to uh, keep working on it, you know. We, they need to know that that's the version of Python I used. Then there's a very, very interesting part of data and how we version data. And data in, in databases change. Um, how can we make sure that I can, I can um, reproduce exactly that output of that model with the, with the exact data I used on the first time I presented my results? And then another question we have to ask, is this uh, project or task a platform specific? Have I built it just for Mac OS? Have I built it for Linux? Is there a Windows option, right? So that I'm not putting a, a restriction on the user on what system they have to, uh, or if they do have to. But knowing that is also important. So what have people been doing in the area of reproducibility? Well, there's a lot of people that have been doing nothing, right? That's an easy thing to do. You do nothing, you don't get reproducibility, right? but has a very low overhead, you don't do nothing. Um, then a very, um, another option is document what you do. And document and write down what you, what you did and share that. That's kind of like the approach the research community has had, right? You share a paper, you describe what was your method, what method you followed to get those results. And that's what you do. On the other side, we've seen um, in more of like the development world, how we've started creating these virtual machines and start sharing images to get the exact same thing. Um, but that had a very big overhead. How we've simplified that overhead with creating containers and with now the, uh, you know, all the Docker movement. But there's a sweet spot in the middle that has lower overhead. That was what we call environments. And a lot of people here might be familiar with using things like virtual env. So let's, let's kind of like um, compare isolation and, and overhead, right? Like you do nothing, you're in like zero, zero, right? No overhead, no isolation, nothing. Um, we can document things, you still don't have any isolation, you don't provide not, nothing, but you have a little overhead, you have to actually write it down. Um, in the space of the, the VMs, we see you have a, a lot of isolation, but also a lot of overhead. A little less overhead, and a little less isolation if you use Docker. And then we have the like, sweet spot of Conda that's um, low overhead and provides a, a pretty good isolation for your project. So um, another part of this reproducibility is not you only, not only have to track those, but you actually have to share them. So we've, uh, we've, we're all familiar with sharing code and that's what uh, GitHub has done, right? There's a, reg a repository where you can access and do download the code. There's a similar approach being done with Docker Hub, right? You have a container, you push it, push it into the Docker Hub registry, and, and, and you can get that container. What happens with binary packages? Well, we have, we, we've had centralized uh, repositories of uh, packages. Like you do pip install, you download from PyPy. Um, but there's also, but what's the alternative for a distributed uh, package uh, repository, repository or registry? That's what we call, that's a project um, called Binstar that I'm also going to present. And I'm also going to present how we can share those environments doing Binstar plus GitHub. So from this section, just like 
we need to meet certain requirements to get reproducibility, Me try to minimize our overhead, and share it. Now I'm going to introduce Conda. Conda is this language agnostic cross-platform package and environment manager that's written in Python. Um, you can view the web pages uh, conda.io and condapydata.org. Um, and a lot of people have this confusion when we talk about Conda, how does Conda compare to Anaconda, to meaning Conda. So hopefully after this slide, everyone like, sets these ideas clear. So Conda is just a package and environment manager. Anaconda is Python, a Python version, Conda, and a bunch of packages for scientific and data analysis. Okay? Now, we've, we found out that like, Anaconda had a, like, a large overhead downloading all those packages, correct? So we came up, well, a lot of people can just manage those packages as they want. So we actually don't need to provide the, the bunch of packages with Conda. They can just download whatever they need. So we have like this mini Conda, which has very low overhead, just Python and Conda. It's, it's clear now? OK. Another, uh, another question that we get a lot is like, well, how does Conda compare to PIP? And so I made this table. You know, and I hope after this table, everyone also has the ideas clear. Um, so as we've said, Conda is language agnostic. Uh, so it doesn't have to be just Python specific. You can, be, you can build Conda packages for other languages for the language itself. So that's a big difference. We see I, I've set up PIP per, plus virtual env because Conda actually handles environments natively. You don't need to use Conda and virtual env. Conda already manage environments with Conda env. There's an also dif a difference in how it, the installation is done. Conda installs binaries, um, and pip compiles from source. And as we said, because of this language agnostic, the environments that you can manage with Conda are actually f of general purpose. Doesn't have to be just Python environments. Is now is now the difference clear? Yeah. Okay. So another frequent question is like, oh, can you use conda and pip? Well, the answer is yes. You can conda install pip, and then pip install whatever dependencies you need to. OK, now we've kind of like gone through each of these different terms. Let's put them all together and kind of analyze uh, how we can do this. So let's go back to our task, our schema of our task. So, when you start doing like this ad hoc analysis, what, what's your, what do you need? You need to, in, to be able to install whatever package you're going to use to perform that analysis, that report, that data cleaning. So that's like conda install. We'll do it for you. When you're working with like these domain problems, you want to have a way of managing what are the dependencies that you're using in that, that specific project. You might have several multiple projects. You want to might switch from one project to the other one. Um, and not and, and have like uh, a way to isolate them, and that's where conda env can help you. Then, um, in the task of actually building libraries and packages, you need to build them. That's where conda build will help you. And when you're deploying to architecture, you might use a combination of them to uh, to help you out. And as I've seen in the example that I'm going to show next, uh, actually my process. Uh, was this like uh, black line that we see going from an ad hoc analysis to a solving a domain problem, um, actually building a library, and then putting it into a production uh, deployment. So as we've seen, um, how this content is multi-language. And you can build pa packages that are R, R packages, Python packages, R itself, Python itself, Java packages, Scala, etc. Let's view conda and reproducibility. We've seen four, four different items before. How we've managed to um, use uh, share co code? Well, we have version control. We have Git. Well, we also have the ability to specify Git tags in conda builds. How about version control? Ver control of versions. So versions version control. So um, Conda provides YAML files where you can specify multi-language requirements. So you can think of 
a requirements txt, but for multiple languages. Then we have the, the problem of data versioning. And Conda, it's just like you can add that data in your Conda package too, with, and there's a couple of uh, um, commands that can help you. This data is still one of like the, the hardest problems because as data grows, you don't want to add it in any binary package. Actually, you want to have your data live somewhere else. This is not really, they, there are several solutions, like, um, like there's different alternatives. People in the um, database world have managed uh, how to keep track of the changes in your database um, with, with different uh, timestamps and, um, and fields in the databases, but still not like a, a, a unified solution to it. Uh, there's still problems on, on like how you manage data versioning because you have to keep track of whatever everything that has happened in your in your data set. Um, then Conda can help you because it actually uh, is platform. You can build um, packages for Linux, Linux, uh, OS X, and Windows. So first thing, how you get Conda? Well, you can get it with, as we said with Anaconda. And all those, um, which will also download all these other scientific and data analysis packages, or just with Miniconda. Uh, a useful tip for people doing a lot of uh, setting up uh, a lot of uh, Linux machines, there's this wget, which downloads the latest Linux 64 Miniconda. So as we said, we can install packages. We can install Python 2.7. We can install Scala. We can install databases or document stores like MongoDB. We can install libraries, pandas, bokeh, spark, etc. And this is the command. On the install, whatever, you can include versions you want. You, if you don't, you get the latest stable version. That's like the first column of your schema of tasks. Second column, more of like this environment management. Well, we've said there's an environment YAML file with a specification of what's the name of your environment, what are the different dependencies that you want to that you want to include? You write your file, you create your environment with this command conda env create. You activate the environment source activate um, by data, and you can list all the packages that are included in that environment, which will also not include just the ones that you specified in your YAML file, but all the dependencies of those packages too. So I can do conda list and get them, or also use a, another a command that's conda env export. And if I want to have like a freeze snapshot of all the versions of that environment, I can use, uh, I can put it on a, a file. I usually call it freeze.yaml. If I do conda list, I get this in like the example I said. I have dots because you know there's a lot more. Um, if I do conda env export into a freeze yaml, I can get, uh, I get the same. Um, structure with all the dependencies and actually the build number, the build string too. Um, I can also list all the environments that I have in my machine. Conda info um, dash e gives, gets me all the environments that I have in my machine. Okay, we've gone from the second column. Let's go to the third column. That's like the build, actually build packages. To build a package, you need to build your Conda recipe. That's usually usually a meta YAML file. And then uh, build a sage or a build bat. Um, this is from the examples of the Conda documentation. So this is an example of a meta YAML file. Um, you get the package name, the source, git tag, URL, requirements for build and for run, um, any tests you want to perform, and uh, uh, any metadata about the uh, license or where you can find information on the package. Uh, you can find a lot of more information on the meta YAML on the Conda documentation. Then, like if it's a very simple package, the build stage can be just like set up the py install. For more complex, you can see examples. There's a repository of Conda recipes, and you can see a lot of examples on how different packages, R packages, Java packages, how this uh, build stage might be done, and you can just copy it. Now we've built the package. We actually want to share it, and that's why I explained before. Uh, bin star, right? And um, I can do con. I need to con install this bin star, logging into my bin star account, um, and then I can upload this build that I've already done into my uh, user user account. 
and then I can install that package do, doing con install from my user, my, from my repository, and the name of the package. Then we have this uh, notion of channels, because as I said, I, I upload it to a username, to my user space, right? Um, so that way I can also, um, I can have um, different channels in my user space where I can install a stable production uh, deploy, and, but also a, 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 the latest dev build. So I can use con install, for example, Bokeh to get the latest stable Bokeh release. But if I'm a Bokeh developer and I want to test the latest one, and uh, I can also install that latest one the same way, con install, and then just pass the channel with the dev, and I get that one. These channels can also be added into your um, environment YAML file. So for example, here, um, imagine I'm working on a project with several people. They're building their own binary packages, and I want to get them from there. So I just add their, their username, and I'm going to, um, so for example, here I have Aaron's and Ben's um, channels. And then I can download things like R, because um, Aaron built uh, an R package. Um, I can also download things like Notch, because Ben um, built a Notch package. Um, same for Spark. And another uh, interesting thing, as we've said, Conda can, can interact with PIP. So if there are PIP packages that um, are not Conda pack, they're, they're not Conda packages for them, you have two options. You can build your own Conda package, or you can just like specify PIP and put the PIP, the PIP packages also in your environment YAML file. Now we're going to see a practical example of my uh, project. Um, so this project is called um, Topic, and um, I, Topic is, was intended to be uh, topic modeling. I had to do some topic modeling on uh, uh, a project, and I was using Gensim, uh, which is a, a Python package for topic modeling. And, um, and then I had to do some visualizations. And then I found out that there was like, I just saw on a tweet that someone had built this uh, cool R uh, LDA visualization. Um, and I think I have it, I have it here. And I saw this, right? And like, you can see like the terms of the different topics that you find. You can see how they're distributed, things like that. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. Um, but it's an R, an R package, right? Um, can I just like have a, why can I, um, included in my in my pro, in my data science project, so this is kind of the motivation behind starting this project. So as we said before, there's this like a flow um, of of my project, and of course all projects start with some kind of hack, right? You put something together, you test it out, and it's, it's kind of this like analysis. You just install things, make sure write a couple of scripts, make sure they work, um, and I call that the hack. Then you, you start saying, oh, this starts make, having some type, type of shape, and I'm going to call this, you know, going to actually make it a project. Um, after the project was done, I said, oh, well, maybe there's people who might benefit from packaging this into a library and being able to reuse it um, so that if you, they can just use topic and have this, like, um, topic modeling plus visualization in their data sets. And I finally added this topic library in our application called Topic Space. Um, so topic modeling very fast is a uh, topic modeling is a um, statistical model for discovering uh, topics uh, in uh, unlabeled text data in, in large documents that you have. You want to see what those documents are about, and you perform LDA on on them, and then you get different topics uh, and how they're distributed in in your different documents and in your corpus. Uh, for more information on topic modeling, there's a good resource there, and here are the two packages I was using. So, when you have a hack, uh, when I was having a like when I started and had this hack, was well, just really like a, just a Python script that imported Gensim, and then this R script that like uh, went back and forth. Um, because it's a hack, you really uh, you know you don't share it on GitHub because you're embarrassed that people will like think that's really bad code uh, and and blaming you for the rest of your life and um, then you don't really care about what versions you're using. You're just like importing whatever it is, making sure it works. You don't worry about platform specific. 
you don't know, like, even know, like, your data somewhere hard coded in your script, probably. Then you say, okay, let's go start getting serious. And um, you start, okay, let's wrapping things into functions, let add more functionality. You still have some scripts because it's specific for your domain problem. Uh, in my case, I was working on um, documents on materials research. Um, then I start creating, you know, importing these conda packages, not just Jensen, but others because I found that they had better features or um, better performance in, in something that I cared about. I also added some PyPy packages. Um, um, I imported those R packages and created this environment YAML file. So now, yeah, and, and now I push things to GitHub because they're cleaner. And I have this environment YAML file also checked into GitHub so I know specifically what versions I'm using. And then I said, okay, after, you know, that was success, successful for my application, my, my problem, I thought, well, maybe I, I could just like, um, you know, do this R Python library, package it up so someone else can also use it. Um, so then you start worrying about generalization, wrapping things into classes, have adding up multiple backends so it's not just CSV files, but also added like Elasticsearch um, and Solar uh, readers. Um, then I had, in order to be able to package in, in, into a Conda package, I had to create Conda packages of, of all those dependencies that I had in PyPy. Uh, also for all the R packages that I needed and the dependencies of, or, of those R packages. I then wrote my Conda recipe and did Conda build and uploaded my topic modeling into my um, user, my account in Binstar. So now we, we have things in GitHub, we're version, we're controlling our versions, we have um, different, um, different packages for different platforms, but our data is still this like, um, it's not tracked anywhere, right? Because it's not specific for this library. Um, at the end, the end fourth column in our process is the application. And in our application that we call topic space, we just add a topic as a dependency in, in our environment YAML file. And, and, that's, and then include any topic uh, code that you want in that application that's a Flask app. And the only problem there, you still see data in yellow. Um, you know, you can pass it as environment variable. Uh, it's still not, there's not an ideal way of how you keep track that that data, uh, it's up, still up to the developer to manage how you, share, how you read the data, where you read it from, how you're, um, you're passing it and things like that. But we've come a long way from being able to reproduce things from when we started. Um, so that's, um, I can show you the actual topic. It's um, here, you can see the environment YAML file that I started with within the project. You can see the Conda recipe with the different um, R packages. Um, and that was it. I also wanted to mention um, that um, that we all think we, we, it's the end of this um, conference. We've had all like a great weekend, I hope. Uh, but on, in the other, you know, other parts of the world, people are having a very hard time. So we should just um, be thankful for being here, being having each other, um, being able to like, uh, thank the organizers and all the speakers that have prepared slides for us and, and everyone who you've enjoyed having this weekend. Uh, I think it's important that we realize and be thankful for what we've got. And any questions? That's, they, it's taken care of. Like you just, you can just add what you think you need, and Conda is going to download those packages and all the dependencies of those packages. So does the package solving um, for you? Yeah.
Right, so, sorry, I forgot to like repeat the first question. The second question is like, is the MongoDB um, the actual database or the Python package for it? And it's like, actually the, the database, so um, I can have an example here. Um, so, I think I had... I think I had it here, MongoDB. So, if I do uh, MongoD data path um, data db uh, db path, it starts MongoDB in this PyData one uh, example. So. So like this Mongo lives in like this environment. So if I get like if I'm out of this environment, like it's not um So if I get out like it's not um so if I do source deactivate uh there's no Mongo DB here. Yeah. So uh, the content, uh, we have a Conda uh, centralized repository. So you can come from there or you can build your own uh, uh, package in your, for example, Beanstar. Uh, so I think the, is the, I think the um, recipe, we can look for the recipe in uh, the Conda recipes. So Conda recipes here. There's a lot of recipes on how those packages are created in the first first place. Um, uh, I think. Yeah. So, for example, here's the MongoDB, and here's how uh, the meta YAML and the build the sage on um, how it uh, builds the package. So usually uh, the question is like how you move it from Binstar to a centralized Conda to a centralized Conda repository, correct? Um, so the the answer is uh, that right now the Conda central repository is managed by Continuum, and usually uh, what happens if we notice or there's a demand, sometimes it's just like a tweet. Someone asks, "Hey, I'm using, you know, we'd like to have this package available in the Conda central repository." Uh, it actually gets. Uh, uh, push if if it's related to uh, you know scientific computing uh, and and data science. Uh, the thing is of um, having distributed systems is that uh, distributing repository is that you still you're gonna get it the same way, right? Like uh, from your channel, you can you can get it, and so you can tell your user just to like it just like dash c and your username the difference for your user. Uh, so. Um, you can always use that. So the um, in uh, continue. So um, if you go to the Anaconda here, you can see all the different uh, licenses for the different packages available through the Conda Central Repository. Uh, in, in your user, in your own user, um, and mainly of them are all PSD, MIT, there's a couple of uh, and GPL, um, but you manage that in your own user account on, on Beanstar. Like you can upload, like you specify, uh, if you go to Beanstar, um, that you manage that uh, yourself, uh, and you can find, um, I don't know, um, you know, if, if I look for Spark, I can see all the Spark, um, uh, Spark projects, and then uh, I can find here where, what the license for that. So you can add the license in your meta YAML file, and so it will show to the users, so the user know um, what, what license that package has.
Um, so the question is, if you have something that's not a Conda package and you want to install it in your environment, um, so for for example, right now for things like things in PyPy, you have the the pip way of specifying things. Um, So it shouldn't be like hard to add uh, a conda package of the that information. So that um, of not the you don't have to do like the entire uh, package, but a way of specifying that that um, building a conda package for that ODBC driver and then um, adding it in your YAML file the same way you add those conda packages. So I would say that's the way um, the way to go. Yeah, yeah. So you can also, when you do conda, you can do conda install of thing of of things that are not even in bin store that are just in your local uh, um, file system. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's that's actually. So the question is like, if you uh, in in pip and virtual env, when you uh, create a virtual environment, you can have the option of not downloading NumPy but getting it from the default, and that's like the default behavior of cond environments. So you never actually install again in your. Uh, in that new environment, it, it it always comes from the default one. So the download does, doesn't happen. It okay. Well, um, thank you.